name is Vicki Cooper. I am the shelter director for the retreat. My name is Anna Miranda and I'm a domestic violin counselor for the retreat. So I'm Loretta Davis. I live here in East Hampton and I've lived here since 2015. I'm the executive director of the retreat. We are in Stephanie's Closet, which is our donation center for our non-disclosed location of our shelter. We had 13 children living in the house when everything shut down. It was really the first time that I felt like we had food instability. We were very concerned um, and we were concerned that people would be afraid to donate and would be afraid to donate clothing and would be afraid to donate supplies. For a while, our hotline was quiet, which is unusual because you know there's people out there who need help. And then it really, really started up in May. You saw that information almost in every newspaper, how the incidence of violence and abuse went up, and they did. It just took people a while to call sometimes. You know, they, they were feeling very isolated and trapped. And as I say, it's the perfect storm for a perpetrator. The survivors didn't have the connections that they normally have. They could go see their family. They could go see their friends. They saw their circle when the kids are at school or when they go to a soccer game. Those things weren't happening and it was harder to check in on people. And the government was saying, it's safe. It's safest if you stay at home. That didn't apply for our clients. I believe like being in lockdown with an abusive partner definitely triggers uh, some crisis situations. And I'm very full aware of the Latino population because I, I work very close with them. So I can say that it's been a, a huge increase in the amount of uh, clients, Latino clients that are coming to see us. The doors remained open the whole time, but we had to do things differently. <laughs> we had to change up our rooms and our rooms sometimes, um, although they're not related, clients would share rooms. We couldn't do that. So we set up one of our rooms as a quarantine room in case we had to do that. And we really had luck down here. People weren't able to go into town. They weren't looking for housing or jobs. We just wanted to be as safe as we could for the staff and for the clients. So everything changed. A lot of people were very fearful um, during their pandemic. They were stuck at home with their abuser. And if they had an opportunity to leave, they realized that to, to get their children out and to get themselves out for safety, they had to leave immediately before he got home because a lot of people were stuck at home. It comes to my mind, one family, she's a mom of five kids, so this is a big family. And she was still living with the abuser and because of finan financial things, she was very scary to leave. And when COVID hit and, and the lockdown happened, she just couldn't handle anymore. And I even get emotional because of it. And then and she came to the shelter. They spent three months here with the family and, and, and they've been able to uh, find housing and move forward with their life. And, and, and it makes me very proud of all the, the, the work that they put and, and all the great work that they did and they've been able to move forward that abusive relationship. So that was fantastic. It's just get me emotional because I know, you know, I'm a human being also. You know, we did have one family here, you know, and she had multiple, um, you know, stab wounds in her body because from her abuser. And, and yet she was a really positive, optimistic uh, woman who had her own job before she came here. But of course she was hospitalized and came right from the hospital and she had her children here. And, uh, you know, sometimes we connect, just to let you know, immediately with the hospital or with a, a court system if it's a, a human trafficking victim. Um, but usually it's the person who has to call, and she called us from the hospital. And even though she had these incredible 
horrible things happened to her. She was very positive and had a good relationship with her kids. And she, we were able to find housing for her. She has two children and, and she was able to get a job. And that was, um, yeah, that was, that was a tough situation because I think we have empathy for someone when we see someone who's young, you know, um, using a walker because of all the stab wounds, you know, and uh, she had been through a lot and yet, you know, she really did inspire us. We had to be very careful not to trigger our clients. We want them to feel a freedom here. We want them to feel safe and secure, but the rest of the world wasn't safe and secure. Uh, I'm really grateful that we have the property that we have and that we have the facility that we have. And we, we had fantastic people that all lived here together harmoniously, which was wonderful. Um, and we had a full staff there was some good changes uh, also. Not everything was bad. <laughs> we start providing more phone counseling that we used to in the past. That was helpful for a lot of clients for different reasons, because of transportation issue, because they, they, they didn't have the childcare at the moment um, to do the counseling, and now they were able to do it. We're much more cautious about um making sure that everything is clean, everything is sanitized, and the clients feel the same way. So I really, um, I feel that the shelter is cleaner than it's ever been, and uh, we're definitely going to continue. Um, well, I lost my sister to COVID, so that was, that was probably the lowest point for me. I, you know, she lives in Florida, um, lived in Florida, and I didn't get to see her very much. And, um, you know, when the pandemic hit, we certainly haven't seen each other. Um, and then to get the call that she was sick and, and then she was hospitalized and then she had passed. That was, that was a very difficult time for my family. And it was a very difficult time for me because I hadn't been able to see her. Um, so personally, that, that was definitely my lowest point. Um, it did inspire me to really take care of myself more. Um, it did inspire me um, to want to figure out what my new normal was and to get back to work and to, to work around the pandemic. And, and that's when I realized that it hits, it hits all families. Um, it doesn't discriminate in the same way domestic violence doesn't discriminate. You know, there was definitely a, a dip, but then when things started to open up, people started to um, generously donate. The donors are so generous and they have been so generous, but it's never enough. We had a mom arrive with four children and uh, they only had the clothes on their back. The two youngest didn't even have shoes with them. So it's really hard to keep it stocked. As my cup is usually half full, it, it would be hope, you know. Um, you know, I had I had the faith that we'd get through that. We had so much support, but I, can't go back I knew that things had to get better. For me, it will be resilience. I think uh, we learned that we have this immense. Uh, we are capable to overcome difficult challenge. Uh, fear. For a lot of women um, and men and children, uh, they were afraid to be home. They were just fearful of being at home. For a lot of children, going out to school is such a relief. They get to be away from the chaos, away from um, the, the trauma, and away from what's going on at home. But as soon as the pandemic hit, they couldn't go to that school. They couldn't escape that reality. They were home for the women and men that live in constant fear, their abuser wasn't leaving to go to work. They weren't leaving to go out for the day. They were all home together. So as a community, we were fearful of the pandemic, but our clients were afraid for their lives.